How's everybody doing tonight? Tonight will be my 31st discussion. Tonight I'm speaking with Salvatore Dell'Aquila of the awesome band at Days Refrain. He was also in the band um, La Grisi, I think uh, you pronounce it, and also Versus Narrow. Um, plus, he's a really, really, really dope artist. Uh, we'll get into that. Hope everybody's doing good. Uh, hope everybody's safe. Uh, it's been cold, but it's going to be a little warmer in New England lately, so um, like I said, hopefully everybody's doing good. Uh, praise to Texas and that mess that happened down there. So, hope everybody's alright though, and uh, he should be jumping on soon, and uh, we'll get into it. Just waiting for him to jump on. Although it is going to warm up, it will be snowing up in New Hampshire tomorrow, of course. But it might hit the uh, 40s midweek, so that'll be like summer, honestly. And if anybody has any suggestions on, on uh, anybody that I'm missing that, that I should talk to, um, reach out, send me a DM. Um, if it's somebody that I really think is dope and, and I admire, um, I'll definitely reach out and, and try to have a talk with them also. So, But like I said, hope everybody's doing good, wearing their masks, being safe. After I get off here, I might try to watch the uh, Bruins Flyers up at Lake Tahoe, possibly. I'll just wait for Sal to jump on. He should be on here in a couple minutes. Pretty pumped to talk to Sal. Uh, Days Refrain is super underrated, like band. They're so they're so good. Um, I was lucky enough to see him a few times in Connecticut, and uh, every time I saw him, I was pumped to see him. Uh, I love that self-titled al album that they put out. Um, what was it on? Uh, was it on Alone Records? Yeah, Alone Records. Uh, so good, flawless, pretty much in my in my opinion. But he should be on here any minute. Usually after these talks, I'll uh, I'll post who I'm talking to next Sunday. Got a special one next Sunday too. You should be on any second. <laughs> it's awkward silence before he gets on, you know what I mean? Uh, that's why I'm rambling. Just waiting on him. He should be here any second. I told him I was going to jump on a couple minutes early just to announce some things. But we should be rolling any any minute. Hope everybody's good though, man.
anybody knows my buddy Ron from Gene Scenes uh, Creamers uh, page, he does a lot of dope stuff, um, all new bands and stuff like that. I got Sal right here, so about to go. Hey, Sal. Hello? Hey, can you hear me? Hey, we did it. <laughs> hey, th uh, thank, you so, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate you taking the time out to uh, chat with me for a little while, and, and uh, especially on a Sunday when it's family. I know Sundays are family nights for me for the most part, so I try to squeeze in a little hour to, you know, talk about the scene and, and hardcore and punk back in the day and, and present day too. So thank you once again for taking time out to do this. Cool, man. Thanks for having me. I'm actually uh, out in my garage right now because I have a house full of kids. I got my niece and nephew over uh, playing with my daughter. And that's, I mean, even trying to work from home during this time, like, I think it was just the other day, my daughter ran into the room while I was on the middle of a call and like she had a bloody nose. She was like, Dad! <laughs> and I had to like sign off real quick. It was, it was pretty gnarly, but uh, it's definitely... Uh, seems like a regular occurrence either that or it's like dad i saw a spider <laughs> <laughs> yeah i have i have two uh daughters as well uh, my mine are um eight and eleven so i i have my hands full as well uh most of the time but nice. but i go to go to work and then i come back so literally i haven't done anything for the last year all i've been doing is like going to work and coming straight back home i i don't think i've gone i haven't i haven't gone out to eat i haven't you know, I'll only go to the grocery store if I have to. Other than that, I haven't gone anywhere in a year. So it's it's kind of work, home, you know, that's that's it. Gotcha. Yeah, for me, it's the same. I think we went out to eat once and that was like for our anniversary and that was like a big uh, to do. But um, yeah, we're just kind of holding it down at home. And, um, you know, in my garage and I got like these space heaters going, it's pretty It's actually melting me right now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been cold the, the the past week. It was freezing cold, and then all that snow hit. Um, uh, are you still in New York? Um, no, I'm in New Jersey now. I want to say I moved back to New Jersey. Maybe uh, it was four years ago, I think. Um, and that was just you know we were living in Queens, and you know we had just had a kid, and just to get anyone from my family, whether it be, you know, my brother or sister, or even my parents to come visit was, was really rough. Or even, you know, coming back to Jersey to see them, it would be like, you know, we're in traffic on the BQE for two hours or, you know, it'll be like this time of night on a Sunday and we're heading home and we're just in traffic, you know, on the George Washington bridge or on the major Deegan in the Bronx. And it just got, I don't know. It just, it, it was time. Yeah. Yeah. Now, were you were you brought up in New Jersey? You were, you. Yeah, I uh, I grew up in uh, Old Bridge, New Jersey, which is about like a half hour south from where I live now. Um, and yeah, from there, like after uh, a day's refrain broke up, I want to say like three months later, I moved to New York. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I still go back to see my parents, you know, somewhat often, but um, you know. When we were living in New York, it was a little it was a little tougher to get back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Now, usually okay. when I, I talk to somebody, I, I usually um, just see, like, what influenced you when you were a kid? What, what kind of drew you to punk and hardcore? Um, you know, what kind of bands, we like, influenced you where you were like, oh, like, I love this kind of music. Like, who kind of inspired you to, like, you know, like that style of music? Man, when I was uh... – shit, maybe I was – I started skateboarding at like a pretty young age. Maybe it was like 11 years old where I was like really starting to somewhat take it seriously or, um, you know, I was able to afford like a halfway decent skateboard. Um, and it would just be like picking up the skate magazines and like, you know, looking to see in the back of the magazines, like what ads for whatever epitaph band or, you know, or if we got a skate video or whether it was like an alien workshop video or a plan B video at the end of, each video would have the credits to see like, you know, what song was, you know, for each uh, skater's part. And I would like sit there and like write it down and, you know, share it with my friends and we would trade videos and stuff. So I want to say like skateboarding was definitely like the gateway drug for sure. 
Yeah, definitely. I hear that a lot too. Um, I didn't, I didn't skateboard, but I always would buy a thrasher and, and, and skim to the back to the music section just to see like, uh, what was, you know, some, something new that I hadn't heard before. Um, so when you did finally start seeing that and, um, what kind of bands were you into back then? Man, I would say, uh, at first it was definitely like some of that earlier epitaph stuff. And it's weird because, you know, even though I was, you know, a skateboarder and I liked that kind of music, even before that, I remember, you know, being just like a little kid, like nine, 10 years old. And, you know, a lot of friends at school who had like, uh, older brothers and shit like that. And I remember one kid was like, you know, making fun of someone else, like, oh, you still watch, like, cartoons, like, I watch MTV, my brother said watch MTV, and, like, you know, they went around the table, and I was like, yeah, I watch MTV, too, and I totally didn't, I just watched, like, cartoons and kid yeah. shit, so I went home being like, damn, I gotta watch, like, MTV to see, like, you know, what's going on, or whatever, and uh, I remember, you know, I started watching MTV a lot, and, you know, like, VHSing, like, you know, Yo! MTV Raps and Headbangers Ball and, like, just started getting into it, you know, like, from that. But even just moving forward into, like, you know, skating videos and Thrasher and shit like that, I remember, like, having my list of bands and songs and, like, going into, you know, just going to the mall and being like, hey, do you have any of these records? And, like, they would be like, no. And then, you know, uh, uh, a mutual friend of ours worked at a record store in the mall and she would uh, order a, a lot of uh, early punk stuff and she like turned us on to, um, you know, a lot of like lookout bands and stuff like that. And she would make us mixtapes and shit like that. So it was, she was definitely like a big, uh, it was like our friend Jill and she totally like, you know, changed our world around in, in that sense. Yeah. And uh, she used to write letters to like, I remember that first uh, Lookout Records comp, that can of pork thing. And uh, she wrote like letters to the bands. And I was like, oh, maybe I should write letters to some of those bands. And I wrote letters to like, you know, the Porcelain Boys. And, you know, I would, because I didn't, you didn't know, like, you know, you figured these guys are in a band and they're on a comp, like they must like live off their music. So I would like ask them stupid questions like, hey, so like, when are you going on tour? When's your next record coming out? And I remember one band, Fuck, I forget. maybe it was the Porcelain Boys, but they wrote back on like the back of a Macy's invoice. And he was like, no, nah, man, I just like load furniture at Macy's. And <laughs> <laughs> so like, he was like, we're not doing anything anytime soon. Like, so I just was like, my mind was like, oh, well, they're not like, you know, full time musicians. Like I was confused by that. Like, you know, you're just trying to figure out like how things worked at that time. But yeah, now, now we're like the um, New York City hardcore stuff. Uh, did you like that back then? Uh, you know, Gorilla Biscuits, Youth of Today, or was that kind of, um, you know, you know, too too far, like, earlier on for you? It was a little earlier on for me. I was definitely more into punk stuff at first. And just, like, a lot of my friends in, like, the early to mid-90s, like, liked hardcore stuff. But it was, depending on what, you know, genre of hardcore you were into, like, um, I remember a lot of my friends liking, you know, stuff that was a little heavier and that, you know, it's like, oh, shit, like this guy fought at this show last night or this guy was dancing really hard last night. And it was definitely like, I, it, you know, really abrasive to the point where I didn't really identify with that. Yeah. So I was definitely more on the punk side, you know, for a while. And then, um, you know, it, it just gradually, you know, I... I you know, went over to the hardcore side and bands like, you know, Lifetime and Battery and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, were you in um, bands before A Day's Refrain, like, uh, you know, playing playing that style of music? Or, like, what, what was your first band that you actually played in? Damn, my first band, uh, I was in a band called uh, Bob. It was, like, Bunch of Bastards. <laughs> and it was, like, uh, this dude, Mark, who's still, uh, man... I think we were in like eighth grade together and he was like, you know, he came into school wearing a Nirvana shirt and, you know, shit, maybe I had a Nirvana shirt too. And we were like, yo, we should like play music together. And, you know, he bought a guitar and I bought a bass and we just kind of learned uh, how to play together. But uh, my a cousin of mine was like a really good musician and he, um, you know, I was trying to get him to, to uh, teach me how to play certain songs. And I was like, man, I really want to learn how to play this Nirvana song or whatever. He was like, 
no, nah, man, you're going to learn how to play this Rush song. You're going to learn how to play <laughs> Ted Nugent. And I was like, but I don't want to. <laughs> and to this day, I'm like thankful. Like he kind of opened up my world into learning how to play different things. But, uh, you know, he really taught me how to play. And uh, Bob, Bunch of Bastards, was my first band. And we played, uh, you know, like backyard shows. And there was a lot of like that, you know, pay to play thing going around. Yeah. And we were so young at that time. But, you know, there was this club in South Amboy called uh, Club Benet. And it was, you know, one of those pay to play things. And it was if you sold enough tickets there, you would get to play the Stone Pony in Asbury Park. So that was like the big thing. Like, oh, man, if we sell enough tickets, maybe they'll let us like open up for a band. And uh, one of my close friends, uh, Joe Genova, he was in this metal band. And they sold enough tickets where they got to open up for uh, Napalm Death and At The Gates, I think, in like 94 or 95. And I was so excited for them. And, you know, I got to like roadie. And we were just like these little kids. And, you know, they were opening up for fucking Napalm Death. And it was, it was crazy. It was like I'd never seen anything like that. Yeah, that's crazy. What, what yeah. style of music was uh, Bob? Was it uh, just like uh, kind of like Nirvana-ish or, or just like straight up rock and roll? Uh, it was more like Screeching Weasel. Like we covered, I think, like three Screeching Weasel songs. And it was just straight up pop punk. Like, I oh, mean, I love that band. We were, it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it got us into, I mean, although we didn't really play too much outside of my hometown, we, um, uh, I think we got it. We had an opportunity to play a show in Jersey City, which was a big deal at the time. And Obviously, none of us could drive, so we had to get our moms to drive us up there. It was, I think it was this bar club called uh, Uncle Joe's, and what ended up happening was our drummer, like, never made it. He, uh, I think he got lost, or he didn't make it in time, and, you know, it was, like, such a letdown. Like, we were like, oh, man, we get to play, like, outside of our hometown, and it just never happened. <laughs> now, do you, now, do you still have the record of that band, or uh, are they kind of lost in the wind? I'm sorry, you broke up. Uh, what would you, what... Uh, do you have the recording still of that that band? I don't think we ever got to record the band. After that, I was in a band called Fifty Two Pickup, and we were more like uh, like propaganda style punk. And like, man, I love that band. It was it was so fun. We were actually recorded uh, a handful of times. I remember our first demo. We recorded uh, at some studio down the shore and it was like this old rocker guy and he had this like bottle of whiskey and he like held it up. He was like, all right, you guys have until like about here until it all starts sounding terrible to me or <laughs> to me. So you better start like, you know, <laughs> like hitting the tracks and, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like that band, um, you know, I, at that time I started putting on shows. So it was like VFW halls and, you know, I had done some shows down in Asbury and up in New Brunswick and in basements. And that's when, um, you know, I got really about more excited about putting on shows than, than playing them. But um, yeah, that, that band was definitely like a, a, a big step for me. And, you know, I loved everything we did. And was that a pop punk sounding band as well? For sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and what, what kind of, um, like shows would you book would you book like pop punk bands or did you kind of infiltrate all different kinds of styles into the shows you were setting up i feel like at that time it was definitely more of like a mixed bag like i I'd booked us with like saves the day one time and um you know there was a a, a friend of mine's band called uh, the low end theory and we'd play with them a bunch and that was like more post hardcore stuff. And then there was just, you know, other punk bands and hardcore bands. I think we played with, damn, it's like escaping me now. I was like, I had a lot of anxiety leading up to this just because it's so hard to, to recollect like that far back. But um, yeah, uh, we had done a bunch of different things. And actually I think, cause I lived somewhat in, um, more like I guess you could say it's northern New Jersey now and uh, I remember growing up like playing shows up this way at like a church or a VFW and like driving up here being like whoa like it's so crazy to play shows outside of you know our hometown so that was like the first step for that yeah now how did uh, a day's refrain uh, begin how did you link up with Sean and, and Matt uh, and was it a three-piece in the beginning or was has it always been a three-piece no, we were actually a four piece in the beginning. Um, 
Uh, the bassist uh, uh, from that band, the Low End Theory, is a, a friend of mine that I grew up with, uh, Parker, and he, um, he, uh, you know, it's a dude I used to skateboard with, and uh, you know, he was. I think he met Sean and Matt you know, just on the internet. I don't know if it was like a chat room or whatever, but he was like, yo, I'm jamming with these guys up north. Um, you know, I can't really do the band. I'm actually going to, you know, go do the low end theory a little bit more seriously. Like, you know, you should go jam with these guys. And I want to say that was like the end of 98. I, I know, I think I was a senior in high school. And um, I was like, yeah, I mean, you know, 52 Pickup isn't really playing anymore. I remember uh, my friend Mark, who I was playing with, you know, I wanted to keep doing 52 Pickup. And he was like, you know, like we keep going through drummers and, uh, you know, like just keeping a band together is hard. And I think he was really into like working on his car at that time. And he was like, you know, working on my car is something I do by myself. So I'm just going to do this. And I was like really kind of bummed. So I was like, all right, yeah, I'll go try and, you know, jam with these other dudes. And uh, it was cool because we got to play in their basement. And, um, you know, I think Sean and Matt, you know, they lived like a half hour north from me. But they were the first people or first friends I ever had that, you know, parents had like white collar jobs. And like, it was definitely like more of like, you know, a nicer area to live than where I live. Not that where I lived was bad or anything. It was just, I guess, you know, the town I lived in was a little bit more working class. But I remember that you know, being pretty conscious of that at the time and being like, whoa, this dude's, you know, and they really wanted to play. And I think we just kind of like, you know, took to each other pretty quick, uh, quick. And we just became fast friends and we were all excited to play together. And, you know, I think Sean and Matt were a year behind me in high school. So they had like another year to go as I was graduating. And, um, you know, we were able to keep it going. But yeah, we were a four piece at first and we didn't have a band name. I think they wanted to call it like, I know they were really into hate breed and they wanted to like call it Puritan or something like that. But we were definitely like trying to write heavier stuff like that, which was totally like not um, in my wheelhouse, but they turned me on to a lot of bands like that. And, you know, Sean would make me mix tapes with Caven and stuff. And I was like, man, this stuff is awesome. And, you know, that's kind of how that got started. Yeah. So, so yeah. when, when they actually showed you those bands and stuff, you, you really, started to embrace that style because like like you said it was kind of out of your wheelhouse and pop punk was kind of your forte but um was it kind of did, did were you like totally into it or were you kind of just like oh, i'll play this music and like you know what i mean or did it kind of start grasping you as you as you went forward well it's weird because you know when you know i was like in middle school i remember i hung out with my buddy joe a bunch and we would listen to metal all the time and we loved like he was a dude who had such an extensive record collection, had like so many cassette tapes and, you know, he had like all the Merciful Fate stuff and like Megadeth and Metallica and like, that's all stuff I loved initially. But, you know, in the mid nineties, you know, uh, you know, coming out in New Jersey, you know, with all my friends going to see like Fury of Five, Any Town Concrete, like that stuff I didn't really identify with as much just because, and I guess it was, I was just kind of taken back from it because a lot of my friends were like, you know, just like to dance really hard. And, you know, that's the, I just didn't really understand it at that time. And I, so I stayed more on the punk side, but, you know, I guess as I started to get into, you know, bands like Lifetime and, and stuff like that, I was like, oh man, I came over to more of the hardcore side. Yeah. Now, now, uh, was the, the Holding On to Silence the first, the first album that you guys, is that the first thing that, a day's refrain recorded no we actually did a, a demo tape and we had um recorded it um down in south jersey at a place that 52 pickup had recorded at and it was just some place we had found out of you know you know uh like in new york you had the village voice and in, in new jersey we have the aquarium where it's just this like music newspaper and in the back of the 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 aquarium they had uh the studio that was like oh you buy one day get one day free so it was always in our mind, like, oh, man, if we could, like, save up enough money to pay for one day, we get the second day free. And we were, like, blown away by this because it was this old rocker dude who I guess his claim to fame was that he did, like, the Blues Traveler demo or something like that. And he had done some, like, hair metal stuff. And he was definitely, like, I don't know how he sustained the studio. It was, like, way out in, like, the fucking woods. And <laughs> it was definitely, like, a weird experience. Like, the dude just... 
kept disappearing and he kept coming back and sniffling a bunch and we're like, this dude just doing tons of coke upstairs. Like, yeah. and I remember Sean and Matt looking at me like, yo, Sal, like, where did you bring us? And I was like, man, I swear, like, I, I don't know. I thought this was like a legit spot. And um, so, yeah, we had done a demo and um, uh, I think we did like just demo tapes. Cause I remember at the time I was trying to figure out how to do artwork for the band and I would just do it on like, you know, photocopy machines and shit like that. And uh, I remember like this one photocopy machine in town at like, uh, like some pharmacy or whatever had like more toner than everything else. And I did all the demo covers on that machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to I used to like race to Kinko's to try and make flyers for the shows that I, uh, I put up. Uh, it was it was crazy back then. Also, I used to set up shows and like write people letters to see if, you know, I know you I know you live in Maryland, but can you come up to New Hampshire or, or you know, Massachusetts <laughs> border and play a show like just randomly trying to get like yeah. acts to come up here uh, through paper and pen. You know what I mean? It was uh, it was crazy back then. Where did you do shows at? What town was it? Uh, I mostly booked shows in Haverhill, Massachusetts at this uh, at this spot called Exit 23. Um, I set up you know, maybe uh, I was like close to like 12, 15 shows there. And I did a couple shows uh, in New Hampshire, too, as well. But uh, usually the New Hampshire shows were like VFWs or or, uh, you know, AMVETS or, or, you know, similar places like that. That's um, awesome, man. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was it was crazy. Everybody really thinks that New Hampshire didn't really have much of a scene, but uh it was it was like a thriving place in the in the nineties, like especially the late nineties and, and early two thousands. There was a, a spot up in Rochester, New Hampshire called Safe and Sound that had like every touring band that you could think of. I mean, um I saw Reversal of Man up there, uh Cave In played all the time up there, Converge, um uh who I mean, disembodied. Uh Overcast was always a, a mainstay up there. Uh I saw Trial from Seattle up there. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was like a ton, ton of shows up in uh, Rochester, New Hampshire. It was a big scene, too. Also, Maine, Maine, right over the border, had a club called Zoots that was also like really popular, too. So it was like you you, you think of New Hampshire, ah, there's nothing going on there. But there was a lot of hardcore kids up here. And, and uh, you know, especially when Screamo started happening, uh, there was a lot of people that were into that as well up here, which is which I can't stand, stand that term Screamo. It's <laughs> <That's> crazy. <laughs> but uh, so Damn. Um, get back to uh, uh, Dave's refrain. Um, where like you guys are so underrated to me, like I look. Like literally, that self-titled album that you guys did is, is like, to me, almost flawless. Like in that realm, in that genre, like in any genre, really. I love that album from start to finish. There's not one bad song. It's like, and I just feel like you guys don't get the credit that you deserve because, like, the band was so fucking awesome back then, and uh, I feel like everybody should listen to it like now still because the music still stands up to this day. And um, I just feel, like I said, I just feel it's so underrated. And, and uh, like, I want to talk to you because I want people to know, like, what a special band it was. And especially I saw you guys a couple times down in Connecticut. And I had the pleasure of recording uh, two sets from you guys. And uh, I just wanted to put that out there. I mean, uh, it's a little ass kissing, but, uh, you know. No, man, that's, that's really nice to hear, man. Thank you for saying that. I mean, it's so crazy because... You know, I haven't thought a lot, uh, you know, about, you know, a lot of the things we did in a while because it was so it was so long ago. But, you know, I feel like a few times it's kind of come up where we've been contacted about, you know, doing a, a, a discography as, as early as like a year ago. Somebody contacted from a label and they, you know, wanted to put something out and, you know, we just just couldn't get our shit together or we just. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. But, yeah, we were. Up until a year ago, we were like, yeah, let's just, let's do the discography. And I don't remember what happened. Like, I think I contacted one of the dudes from the studio that we recorded at and he couldn't find the stuff. And my brother, who uh, has a recording studio here in New Jersey, he was like, oh, well, if you just get us a CD, um, you know, I could take all the tracks and master it and make it sound like one thing. And we couldn't even get that together. I think, you know, Matt was like, oh, I think I got some CDs at, you know, my parents' house and, and, uh, you know, we can use one of those. I have some still in the shrink wrap. And then like, you know, I never heard back from him and I never really followed, followed up. So it's yeah. definitely been like a little bit, I don't want to say self-sabotage, but it's, 
we were just like, uh, you know, like it's, it, it's kind of crazy that, you know, all these years later that, you know, people still want to talk about it, but it's still like, it's, it's, you know, we, uh, I don't know. It was, it was, you know, I, I love those guys to this day. Like I loved doing that band. We definitely like had our shit together and we were like somewhat of a, you know, a pretty well-oiled machine in the sense that we would really make an effort to, you know, play out a lot and play out of state and tour and do a lot of shows. So, I mean, I guess it, it, it you know, it, it's really nice to hear that, 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 you know, all these years later that people still kind of care. So, so thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. The discography would be incredible. Uh, I know also um, if you guys ever wanted to do tapes, uh, my buddy Ron from Pittsburgh does tapes and he would, he would be, you know, thrilled to do a discography uh, on tape. If because uh, I I know all of a sudden people love tapes now. I don't have a tape player <laughs> anymore. Yeah, me neither, uh, dude. <laughs> but but he loves tapes and like pe all of a sudden like people love tapes all of a sudden now. I don't I don't like I don't understand it, but it I, for some reason a lot of people are looking for tapes now, which is crazy to me. But uh, he, he's a, he's a, he does a lot with like newer bands now and and makes all the tapes and does all the covers and stuff like that. Uh, for for them not not the artwork but just like puts it all together and and puts it out for them so uh, um you know if anything if you guys ever wanted to do tapes i could i could hook you up with him too also um going back to discography holding on to silence you can't find that anywhere i used to have it a long time ago and i lost it and literally i was like searching for weeks and i can't find it anywhere like the bar still split is is kind of hard to find but you can at least hear that on youtube i think somebody has that on youtube but like that first cd like it's it's almost impossible on the internet to find it um do you still have uh that cd or um i think i have the mp3 somewhere i don't think i have the cd if anything like i have the the cd case because i remember being so proud as to you know making that cd layout and i think i was like more proud of the way the layout came out not not so much more than the music but because I was, you know, I'd never really done like a full like record layout before. So that was like my first CD layout. And I remember uh, Sean and Matt and just all those dudes, especially like what I do now as a designer, like them being like the harshest critics. <laughs> I remember if I like, you know, showed them something, Matt would just like tear it to shreds. <laughs> and to this day, I remember being really thankful for that because, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, it definitely like made me get like a thick skin in terms of, you know, what I did as what I do as a career. But, you know, holding on to silence, we, uh, shit, where do we, re oh, that was the one we had done uh, with, we had done half of that with Brian McTurnan, um down in DC. And um, we'd done the other half with uh, Ken Olden in DC, just because I remember uh, we were still a four piece at that time. And, um, you know, we were, I think we were on our second drummer. We'd gone through, a, you know, a bunch of drummers. And uh, this dude, Rich, uh, played drums for us. And he, like, I don't know, I just, for some reason, I remember, like, rolling into Brian McTurnan's studio and these four, like, really young kids from Jersey and we were, like, total wise asses. And we were, like, I just remember Brian McTurnan totally not liking us at all. Like, just because we were just, like, these shitty young kids, like, from Jersey, just you know, just smart asses. And, you know, obviously I don't think he was too into what we were playing or he had just already recorded that kind of stuff to death, having already done some of the cave and stuff. And, um, but yeah, it was, it was definitely like a journey recording that first record because we went through two studios and it took us a while. And, um, but yeah, I remember being really proud of that record when it was done. I think <laughs> there's so many good stories that come out of that because, and Sean is like always the first one to, you know, remind me of the story of, you know, we were recording with, uh, it was, I think the second or third session for that. And we were recording with Ken Olden in DC. And uh, we were, he had like this, uh, um, I was like this loft area where we could sleep in. Cause we had to drive down to DC to record it. And then we slept in this loft area and it was in the middle of summer and it was so hot. And there was just like all this junk around and there was this old air conditioner. I was like, yo, maybe if I plug in this air conditioner, it'll be cooler for all of us. And I plugged it in and it shorted out a circuit and everything went out. And we were like, oh shit. And then like the next morning the power came back on, but 
Tim had tried to get the reel to reel to work and it just kept spinning. It wouldn't stop. And he was like, Oh, that's kind of weird. And he was like, that's so weird. He's like, the only time this ever happens is if there's some sort of power surge. And we didn't tell him about the night before. And I had to come clean and be like, yeah, dude, I had plugged in this like rogue fucking air conditioner upstairs and shorted out everything. And he just like was so bummed because he had to call this dude to fix this tape machine. And uh, it wasn't going to be cheap. And uh, I just, oh, man, I remember just feeling like such an asshole. <laughs> But yeah, yeah we, but, we we got it done. <laughs> I mean, if you're, you're you're boiling hot though, I mean, I I would have tried to plug it in too. You know what I mean? What what? Uh, well, yeah, we were also lot, like we had you know we were recording all day, and then uh, you know we went out just walking around the monuments at night, you know, just being idiots. You know, oh, I remember just getting back and just being so hot for whatever reason and plugging it in, and <laughs> but yeah, it took a, a a few more times going back to Ken and. I remember the last time we went back to him, I called him early in the day and I was like, hey man, we're gonna drive down to DC today. He was like, well, well, the, the tape machine isn't fixed yet. And I was like, all right, well, should we come down? He was like, yeah, I don't know. I'm like, all right, we're coming down. And we showed up and he was like, yo, you guys are so lucky because the tape machine guy is finishing up right now. And he was so pissed because he was like, oh, great, now I have to work tonight with you <laughs> idiots. But also you guys broke my tape machine and you know, thank God he didn't, charge us anything extra or, or whatever but yeah we were like i don't know <laughs> we were just young kids <laughs> now now did you play um a lot of shows um during that time when that first um cd came out that yeah we got it like playing out a lot yeah i think um you know we had played a, a handful of shows with that lineup you know we had for some reason, what sticks out in my mind is before we had Rich as our drummer, we had driven out to play, uh, I don't think it was Scranton. I think it was like Wilkes-Barre Fest out in Pennsylvania. And uh, I think, you know, they had like a bunch of bands. I think it was like Chamberlain or the Casket Lottery. So, I don't know. There was like a bunch of bands. And then there was this uh, this New Jersey band that, that came out there called X Number no. 5, which we were like a huge, huge fans of. And they, uh, one of the dudes had, you know, run all the booking at the Melody Bar and he saw us play and they offered us a show opening up for Caven and Botch. And that was like, I remember like being like, damn, like I could just play this show and then just quit playing music altogether. Like, are you <laughs> fucking kidding me? And I remember that was the show where uh, Caven had the Creative Eclipses record because I think their van had gotten caught on fire at the time and they had these like burnt copies with these, you know, these CDs with like melted jewel cases and stuff they were selling. And, you know, I remember like handing a, a demo to, uh, or Rich had handed a demo to the, the cave in dudes were like, yo man, like give this a listen. Like maybe like, you know, if Hydra Head is interested or whatever. And obviously they heard it and they were like, Shit, fuck these guys. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we had played a bunch of shows like that. I remember like, you know, we played a, a basement show in New Brunswick with Poison the Well and, and like I had put on a show in um, I put on a bunch of shows at uh, this VFW in New Jersey, actually in my hometown called the M&M Hall. And if I'm thinking back to it, because I started doing shows there, I think when I was 17. And just to like, I don't even know how that was legal to rent out like a hall, like a fire hall to someone, you know, who was too young to even, you know, I guess these places didn't have insurance or whatever. Yeah. But I remember, um, you know, we had booked these, all of these shows that looked like fests. Like there were so many bands on it just because like I was fronting a lot of that money out of pocket. So, mm. you know, you'd always be afraid, you know, if you're someone who has done shows as well, like shit, if I'm renting out this place, like I'm not going to get my money back. So you'd always try and like get people in the door so you didn't like lose a bunch of money, which back then, like I remember I was working at a supermarket at the time. I didn't have any money. So that was like all the money I had in the world. It was like $150 or whatever. And then, you know, to hire whoever to do sound, that was like another, you know, 50 to hundred dollars. That was a lot of money. Yeah. I used to do the same thing. I'd, I'd, I'd try to, although I'd try to call my friends and be like, Hey, I need a PA. Like anybody got a PA I, I can borrow. It was like, I was doing <laughs> stuff really makeshift. You know what I mean? And yeah. Yeah. It totally. Would be like, Oh, I have three vocalists. And I'll be like, uh, I only have one one mic that works like uh like i mean it was rough in the beginning definitely i was i was kind of the same thing and i think i was pretty young too when i started and and like you were saying vfws really don't i think all they care about is the money and like 
you know, they're all drinking downstairs anyways. And like, they're just like, yeah, just don't break any windows. And like, you know, and yeah, it totally. happens, happens. You know? <laughs> so yeah, Man, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a similar, it's a similar thing for sure. Um, how was, uh, when you played with botch, how was that? I love botch. Botch is like, uh, like Dude. One, of, one of my all time favorite bands. So, so good. Like definitely they sounded amazing. Like, just that, I mean, I miss shows at the Melody Bar in general just because I love that space. I think it was such, like, a perfect space, um, you know, for shows. I remember, like, you know, going to the last Lifetime show there and just being, I think I've seen the Bouncing Souls there. It's like, I don't think it could fit more than 100 people. I know they definitely have fit more than that, but that space definitely I owe a lot to, you know, just coming up in, you know, punk and hardcore and, you know, all the things they would do for, especially just like all ages shows, like on a Tuesday afternoon or something like that. So, but yeah, Botch fucking crushed it at that show for sure. Yeah, definitely. I, I love Botch. I only got to see him once, but at least I got to see him. Uh, I, I think I saw him in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, I forget. I, I Honestly, I don't even know who they played with because uh, it's <laughs> like you said, it's been so long and I've been to so many shows and, and, you know, I, it's hard for me to remember every show that I actually saw. Um, a lot of my friends are like, oh, you know, you remember this show we went? And I'm like, honestly, I can't even remember. And I was like, <laughs> we did? I was like, I saw that band? Are you sure? I was like, the, like, yeah, we got pictures of it. And I'm like, oh, all You're right. You're getting old, awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like you said, though, it is like almost a lifetime ago for, for you know, especially um, like me. Uh, I, I was going to shows and I think I started going in 19... 19- well, my first show was 1983, and then uh, then I started really going to shows. Maybe uh, in '87 was like when I started going full time all the time. Um, but '80 80, '83, I was real, real young. I got scared shitless. My first like hardcore punk show. So uh, what was your first real, show? Uh, it was uh, it was SSD. Um, dys and angry samoans at the channel oh, in boston shit. massachusetts yeah and it's it's like a pretty big venue too but for for the longest time i thought it was at this place called gallery east but um my the guy that took me there was actually uh he was 17 i think and he had known my cousin and like i used to hang out with my cousin all the time my cousin was a metalhead and i was kind of a metalhead too and he's like oh i'm going to this punk show in boston like um you you know, he knew that I I liked like the heavier metals t- uh, type stuff. And he was like, oh, do you want to go? And I'm like, uh, you know, and my parents were very like, you know, uh, you know, as long as you come home at yeah, night, totally. like, yeah, back then, you know, uh, <laughs> so I went and I kind of had longer hair, which was like nobody really had long, longer hair when I when I got in that place. So I was scared. And plus, I saw people jumping all over the place, pushing, shoving, you know, and uh, so it scared me. And I was like, all right, I, I love the energy and stuff like that. But like, I might need a few more years to like grow up and, and, and actually like be able to like handle myself there. Not that I was like jumping in the crowd anyway. Yeah, yeah. It was just something that kind of scared me, but I love the energy. So I was drawn to it. You know what I mean? And and uh, and then since then, it's it's been nonstop shows. For a while though, I stopped going to hardcore and, and punk shows. Um, maybe like 2008 I kind of stopped going to hardcore shows and I started going to hip hop shows mainly so I started recording hip hop shows and oh, and uh and then just this past like 3 years um I started going back cuz I missed seeing heavy music and stuff like that so I went and saw Jerome's Dream when they got back together again and, oh cool and I actually saw like a few you know old old hardcore bands I saw Agnostic Front uh like a year and a half ago when I saw Murphy's Law and uh Shia Terra and 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 stuff like that um but like I said, I got I got the fever for it again, and I I wanted to record some more stuff because that's what I used to do. I used to bring my camcorder and and record, you know. Plus, I was in like some small, uh, you know, screamy hardcore bands as well. Uh, so I played, you know, the shows that I was setting up in Haverhill, Massachusetts as well. Nothing nothing crazy. I mean, we played probably you know twenty shows, and then I was in another band that probably played another you know 12 shows or stuff like that but i've been in and out of bands back then uh so you know i had my foot in <laughs> everything hardcore <laughs> and punk i guess that's awesome uh, man i remember like you know you said you went to your first shows in like 83 obviously it was like much later for me but i remember like i mean you know my parents 
I remember going to my first few shows and like not telling my parents where I was going or like as long as I was home at a certain time, they didn't care where the fuck I was. I don't know if that was like more of like a latchkey kid kind of thing, just because they were so used to me just getting on my skateboard and going and then coming home, whatever. But I remember like, you know, to to get to New Brunswick from my hometown, I think it was like a dollar fifty to take the bus up there. And that's where like a lot of the shows you know, were happening. And I remember like just being on Rutgers campus as a kid and like looking at my watch being like, damn, I got to get home or like, you know, I'm going to get in trouble or just being at like, you know, Manville Elf's Lodge, I think was like the first time I went to a show where there was like a lot of literature and stuff on the table where it was, you know, just about veganism and stuff like that. And just remember like having my mind blown, like, oh shit, like that's like, this is fucking crazy. Like, and also like, damn, like will my parents be really like bummed that I'm here? Like, cause I didn't know what it was or, you know, if it, I don't know, but it was, I don't know. I miss having my mind blown like that, but that was definitely like a, a um, you know, like the, the gateway for a lot of that stuff. No, no, as, as parents, um, can you imagine like your daughter or my daughter's like, doing something like that because I don't even let him go outside alone you know what I mean? and, I, and, I, and, I, and I have a pretty big yard and uh, I'm like you're not going outside without me what are you crazy like it's, it's, uh, I mean times have changed so much and like you know what I'm saying though it's it's I can't totally imagine uh you know an 11 year old going to a hardcore show uh, you know what I mean? With a 17 year old buddy, you know what I mean? Like I just, Dude, I can't imagine like getting away with a lot of the things I used to get away with as a kid. I remember like, you know, me and my buddy Cooter and a lot of the dudes I grew up with skateboarding. Like we were in, you know, middle school, like early high school, like taking the train to Manhattan to go skate. And as long as we were home by like bedtime, it was okay. And like, you know, our parents had no idea where we were. I'd call from the payphone and be like, yeah, I'm down the street, like a, fr a friend's house. And I'd be like, you know, somewhere in Chinatown, like, or skating the Brooklyn Banks or whatever. Like, so, yeah, I can't imagine that. I'd like to think that, you know, obviously there's going to be all these guardrails and shit for our kids in the sense that, like, oh, we'll always know where they are to a certain extent. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, man, I hope they can kind of navigate around that to kind of like, you know, to, you know, whether it be lie to us or just do something cool without us knowing about just because there'll probably be some way for them to get away with it. But I mean, hopefully it's, you know, it's safe, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, there'll always be some way for kids to figure out a way around some sort of parental guidance. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah true. I, obviously it's going to be a little harder these days, but I, I mean, hopefully, yeah, there's some way to figure out a way around it. <laughs> Uh, no, um, going back to Dave's refrain, um, the assistant split winter tour CD. How, how was that tour? Uh, what did you think of that tour? And um, you know, what what were some of your memories of, of of touring with the assistant? I know you guys played with a bunch of like amazing bands too during that tour. Uh, how how was that? And what were your memories of that? Well, the the assistant, I think, around that time was definitely like our our like our you know like our sister band, like we were definitely like, uh, Sean was uh, roommates with Tom in uh, Highland Park right outside of New Brunswick and playing with those guys a bunch and just seeing them play, like it definitely like changed the way that we played in the sense that I, I think when, you know, Rich had left the band uh, or whatever, I think Tom, Tom had jammed with me and Sean a bunch and he was going to be the drummer for a day's refrain. And we were trying to show him our songs. And he was like, yeah, but what if we play this song? And he, like, just showed us, like, these three songs. And we just, like, looked at each other. And they were just fucking, like, blast beats. Like, it's something we, like, stuff we had never played before. Yeah. And I think that kind of, like, split our minds open, uh, uh, you know, a little bit. And, um, you know, that's when we had kind of looked at Matt. And we were like, yo, man, maybe you should just play drums and we'll be a, a three-piece. And uh, I forget how that conversation went, but, you know, it just, I don't know if that was just like some kind of like natural progression or whatever, but, um, you know, and then we had started playing with them, with the assistant a bunch on, with Matt on drums. And um, at that time I was working this, I was an intern at uh, a, an advertising agency in Manhattan, which was like a big change for me because I had always worked, you know, like, these random kind of jobs. Like I worked at a supermarket, I worked at UPS, I 
you know, worked at with my mom. My mom's a bus driver. I worked with her at her bus company. And, um, you know, so when I got in this internship at this advertising agency, um, I had access to all of, uh, you know, these printers and, you know, these uh, CD burners or whatever. So I was able to, that, that split, I was actually able to make at my job. And, you know, all the dudes from the assistant came up and we cut all the layouts. And I think the, the record we did before that, which was like just a demo EP, I, I think we got those made out in the Bronx somewhere. It was like in the back of the Village Voice. It was like some dude would burn you up 100 CDs for, you know, however much money it was at the time. And I went all the way through the Bronx to pick those up. But the the split, I remember we had done it ourselves and, you know, uh, we had made posters and shit just because I had access to, you know, all of these printers. And I think, you know, after a while, word got out that like, oh, shit, like Sal can print all this stuff. So I would start, you know, printing stuff for other bands. I think like, you know, Jamie from Off Minor came to my office one day with his mom and I print like all of these Off Minor record uh, inserts because they couldn't get them back from the printer at the time so you know it was me jamie and his mom like cutting these layouts <laughs> but uh yeah that was um you know that was uh like a winter tour and that was our second tour and you know we had played you know out of state and you know we had done a full u.s tour by then so that was definitely like the first time we had shown up to places especially with the assistant and there was definitely a good amount of attendance and um yeah, that was uh, that was a really good tour. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if that answered your question. I just kind of like went off on the thing. <laughs> no, 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 perfect. Like in the first tour you guys did, um, did you tour with a, another band or was it you guys just went out on your own uh, on that first tour before you did this assistant tour? Uh, we went on our own. Um, and because I was working at that advertising job, I worked on a 52nd and Broadway in Manhattan. And we, I was like a block away from a post office. So I remember like being on, you know, uh, book your own fucking life and just booking the whole tour, pretty much the whole tour through that site and having to call people on the phone and just being that I was so close to the post office, I would just mail out tons of CDRs like every day. I, I mean, I don't forget how many shows we played on that tour, but however many CDs I'd sent out in the mail was like double that. So um, we had done that first tour because I had told my job at the time i was like hey i'm gonna do this thing like you know it'd be really cool if you know you let me come back after we do this because i think we went out for a while i don't know if it was like two months or it was and we were you know super young and uh we had done that tour and then when we went out with the assistant you know obviously you know there was more people showing up to the shows and we were like oh shit like this is you know uh, you know, something that's starting to manifest itself or, or, or whatever. But that was definitely something where we saw a difference between that first tour and the tour with the assistant. Now, do you remember any, uh, any of like the, the good shows that you guys played with the assistant with some other like cool bands during that tour? Was there anything that stood out to you wh where you played? And also winter tour, were you, were you uh, driving through snow in the east or was it kind of mainly out, out west? No, it was all down the East Coast. And um, I think we had gone down to Florida and we played a bunch of shows there, but we had stopped, you know, in the Carolinas and Atlanta. I think it was a really good house show in Atlanta from what I could remember. And <laughs> I think uh, the, the dude, uh, Rob, from the assistant was sharing my bass equipment and he blew my bass cab <laughs> right before we played in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> no shit i hadn't thought about this in years but i remember like turning it on and like it was obviously blown we played the whole set anyway and i remember going to rob like after the show like dude you blew my bass cabinet he's like no nah, i didn't <laughs> i was like it doesn't it doesn't play it's like you know he was like yeah it wasn't me man I'm like you played right before us <laughs> and it's so funny because you know i remember right at then and there i would never let anyone borrow my equipment again so I think, uh, and Dima from the fiction would, to this day, won't let me forget it because we played with them in Hot Cross, like somewhere upstate. And it was like in a basement and you had to like carry your rigs down this like a ladder. And I remember he was like, yo man, can I borrow your stuff? And I was like, no man, I'm sorry, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> and I remember him being so, like we didn't know each other at the time and him being so bummed about it 
to, to years later being like, yo, man, remember when you let me borrow your base equipment <laughs> that one time? <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I've, I've, I've seen some uh, pretty horror stories of uh, people b borrowing stuff. Um, my buddy who was in a band let um, the fair. I don't know if you've ever heard of the band, the farewell chapter, but um, it sounds familiar. Uh, they were from Massachusetts. They they put out like a seven inch, and and I think they had a split with somebody else. Uh, it was like a uh, few members of um, Backstabbers Incorporated, like the drummer from. Uh, I remember those guys. Was was in uh, Farewell Chapter, but my buddy had let them borrow an amp, and that and he's just like, it's brand new. Like you can borrow it, just don't like don't do anything to it. And the Farewell Chapter was kind of a chaotic band that like you know, spazzed out when they played. And of course the kid kicks his brand new amp over. And so we were friends with the drummer um, that also played in Backstabbers. And he- Is that the same dude who also played in Hassan Sabbath? Was that no, that not that No, that kid. That was All before. Right. That was before. And then like, um, I think that kid played guitar in Backstabbers though. He didn't, like he played drums in Hassan Sabah. And then I think he was playing guitar later on in Backstabbers. If, oh, if I'm okay. not mistaken. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, but uh, at that show, when the amp went over, uh, our friend that was playing drums for the Farewell Chapter picked up a snare drum and threw it at that guitar player's face that was, he was in the same band and it cracked his face open and split his jaw wide open. And uh, so, I mean, your story kind of, it's not as crazy as that, but uh, I, I understand where you, where you would be like, yeah, <laughs> no, no more, uh, no more borrowing my stuff. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, that was, um. I think we were doing that tour and we were actually going out for a little bit longer than the assistants. So they had to drive back home from uh, Alabama, I think it was, or, and we were driving up North. I think we were going to play like uh, Detroit or something like that. And um, what happened was I had like, uh, my grandfather had passed away. So we couldn't finish the last few uh, dates of that tour. So we had to just head right back home. But to your question earlier, it was, you know, it was like, in my memory, it was like snowing really hard and we drove all the way home throughout this fucking blizzard. And I think Sean was driving at the time and I don't know how the hell he got us home because it was fucking scary. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's yeah. the scary thing about touring and, and, the and well, in the winter time, you know, almost anywhere. I mean, look at Texas just this past like week uh, going on down there. I mean, who would think if you were touring and you're driving through Texas, uh, like, some crazy shit like that would happen. But uh, I mean, touring in the winter is, is you're taking your, your chances for sure. And, and hoping that you can make it to the venue, uh, you know, bearing totally. any, any, any shitty weather, you know what I mean? Uh, so that's why I always ask winter tours. I'm always like, Oh, was it like a, a tough, <laughs> you know, tough go or, or, you know what I mean? Um, when I had, uh, when I was playing in La Grisha, we'd done a bunch of dates with the loved ones and gaslight anthem. And I remember we played Pittsburgh and, you know, we were all driving back to New York to play at the Knitting Factory the next day. And I don't even think we made it 20 minutes outside of Pittsburgh, but we all had to stop at, like, get motels and shit like that. Because it was just scary, right? I mean, Pittsburgh, it's like snow is no joke. It's like... Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after that tour, um, what, what did you... You guys did the... Was the fiberglass sessions, like... Um, CDR kind of just a build up to the self title, you know what I mean? Because there was was that just kind of like the same song, just building up to making the the self title album on Alone Records. Yeah, the 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 Fiberglass Sessions was. Uh, I don't want to say it was more of a demo. We recorded that with Steve Roach, and um, you know we were still trying to figure out. I don't want to say we were trying to figure out what kind of band we were going to be, but that was the the record we brought on the first tour that you know we put out ourselves so i guess it was more of a demo but it looked like a legit release because i worked at this you know ad agency with with access to all these uh printers and cd burners and stuff like that so like all the money or e every time we sold one of those cds all the money went to us so that was definitely what what kept us afloat on that first tour and you know we screened all our own shirts and shit like that i remember being in a i don't know new mexico or arizona and like we ran out of shirts and you know i called my mom and i was like yo can you there's a silk screen in the basement can you like put it in the mail and like mail it and so he 
she like mailed us the silk screen and we like screened more shirts. You know, we went and bought shirts at some like craft store or whatever. <laughs> and I like, you know, managed to talk the, the dude at the register into giving us his employee discount so we could, you know, make shirts. I, I don't know what the fuck, how I pulled that off, but, <laughs> but yeah, the fiberglass sessions was, you know, more of a demo, like leading up to the alone records thing. So it was like, you know, we had that record, that demo for the first tour and then the winter tour. And then right after we'd done the winter tour, we'd started recording the, the record for uh, alone, which I don't even know if we knew at the time it was going to be out on alone, but we just knew we were going to record a record. And then, and then right after that was kind of like the, the last thing you guys recorded was the the was it the Neil Perry split or the Barstow one? But I, I feel like the Barstow was before Neil Perry, right? That was actually the same session. It was all like that. Those, you know, I think it was five songs we had done in that same session. So half of those went to the Barstow split, and half of those went to the Neil Perry split. Um, the Neil Perry thing was was you know on our first tour, like uh, we were obviously both bands were from New Jersey, but we didn't know those guys. So we had, you know, played our first show together out in, I don't know if it was Phoenix or somewhere. And, you know, from there, we went all the way up the West Coast together. And it's it wasn't a planned thing. It was just like, all right, we're both, you know, touring together. And, we, you know, we became kind of like fast friends. And I remember, like, we were, I think, like, maybe it was like four or five days behind page 99 majority rule because like every venue we'd gone to, we'd seen like tons of page 99 stickers, and majority rule posters and shit like that. Um, but yeah, that was um, shit. I don't even remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, uh, I was just asking what came first, the Barso or the Neil Perry and, and how it kind of came about. Like, um, Oh yeah. So we had those, those songs. We didn't know what we were going to do with them. And, uh, Josh from Neil Perry and, you know, the now and all those other bands and Andy from robotic empire had moved into an apartment in my hometown in New Jersey. So I would go over and hang out with those guys all the time. Andy, I think was doing the label out of this small apartment over by my old high school, which was really weird. And, um, you know, I'd played them the songs and him and Josh heard them and they're like, yo, we should do a split. And I was like, all right, cool. And like asked the, you know, the rest of the dudes in the band. And we were like, yeah, I guess those, those songs will just go on a split. And um, I think Josh from Red Scroll Records had reached out and was like, hey, do you want to do a split with this other band? And we're like, yeah, we got these extra songs. Cool. We'll just, you know, throw them out there. So, yeah, that was all. I think that was the last time we had recorded together was those five songs. Oh, that's awesome. I think Josh still still is running a, a record store in Connecticut as well. I think he had just moved. Uh, and I know him and Brian from They and the Children did like, I, I think they helped each other a lot, like setting up shows in Connecticut. And uh, that's where, where I saw Dave's refrain. I saw, I saw you guys at, uh, I don't know what friendly fest it was, but uh, you guys, when you guys played friendly fest, it was almost like some of your last shows because I remember Sean announcing that he was moving to California uh, during those sets. And uh, it was probably, you know, some, some of your last shows that you guys uh, were playing at that time. I think that was like 2002 or was it, was it, no, that's right. It was 2002. Actually, Josh and Brian and all those dudes drove down to uh, New York from Connecticut because we had printed all of the layouts for that seven inch at my job. So I think, you know, usually it was I'd wait for everybody at my job to go home and then I'd sneak people upstairs. And I remember they came up and we we're all cutting layouts together and shit. And I remember them being like, yo, how are we up here right now? Like doing this? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that was um you know uh, that that friendly fest was one of our last shows if not the show before our last show so it was definitely like you know we had a even before that tour we knew we were going to dissolve the band because sean wanted to be um you know uh like full-time touring and just be playing more and i think matt was more was also on board with uh uh being able to do more of an extensive tour and I was like yo man like I kind of got this job I can't really let it go and um so yeah we just made a decision to to break the band up and uh yeah so it and it just it was just it was probably you know things run their course or people get mad at each other but it was just like the perfect way to 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 kind of say goodbye because we knew we were breaking up and we we're going to do this like uh blaze of glory tour which is what we called it and, um, 
which was crazy because we had done all the whole US again and all the places we had gone to a year prior, there was definitely like a lot more kids at the show. And we were like, man, this is, you know, this is, you know, pretty crazy. But I guess this is how this, ha this happens. You're, you're a touring band, you play a place. And the next time you come back, there's a little bit more people show up. So that was, uh, you know, it was definitely the, you know, we knew we were going to call quits. Yeah. Now, was the last show in New Jersey? Did you guys play like one last New Jersey show or, or was it kind of like somewhere else for your last show that A Day's Refrain played? No, it was, in, it was in New Jersey. We had booked like a last show at, you know, one of the VFW halls in my hometown. And, you know, uh, my brother's band played, which is still to this day, probably one of my favorite bands come out of New Jersey. They were a band called With Resistance. And they actually like covered one of the songs from our original demo, which was, you know, that we had recorded with that rocker guy <laughs> from years <Yeah>. before. <laughs> and it was so awesome. But uh, yeah, that was, yeah, it was like the last around. I think, I don't even know if it was the next day or a few days later that Sean was just driving out to San Francisco. So that was it. So it was like, all right, we're playing the show. And then, you know, that's it. And then Sean moved to San Francisco. And I want to say it might've been two months later that I just moved to uh, New York. And, yeah. and af after days refrain, um, you know, dissolved, were you, were you still like itching to play kind of maybe in a local um like hardcore-ish uh, punk band or, or did it take a while before like, um, like when did La Grisha start? Like 2008 or? Yeah, La Grisha started in 2008. Like after uh, A Day's Refrain broke up, I didn't want to play music for a long time. I didn't want to, you know, like I still went to shows pretty regularly, but I definitely was like, I moved to this apartment in the East Village on Avenue C and, uh, you know, the right move would have been to move to an apartment, you know, somewhere with a bunch of roommates. But I was like, I had lived, you know, with my parents and I shared a room with my brother for like almost what, 21, 22 years. I was like, man, I need my own. I need my own room. I need my own space. So I like emptied my bank account and moved into this, you know, too expensive apartment in the East Village. And I was also like coming out of a really like shitty relationship at that time. Like that was like, it, it's hard for me to think about back to that time period, just because that relationship was so shitty. And I think a lot of my friends tried to warn me and talk me out of it. So, you know, when that relationship ended, I just felt like really kind of like silly and regretful and just kind of embarrassed that I stayed in it for so long. So when I moved to New York, I was like, all right, I'm going to be this new person. Like I live here now. I'm not really going back to New Jersey anymore. And uh, I was just going to try and figure out like who I was at that time. And I figured I would just be like, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the kids I went to high school with were still in college and doing whatever. So I thought that was going to be like my college. Right. So I figured oh, I'll just be like this, you know, this dude working at this ad agency and maybe they'll hire me one day and you know, this will be my, my education. Right. So, uh, Brian Louie who played in Joshua fit for battle had moved to New York in 2003 and uh, he didn't really know anyone else, you know, in New York at the time he moved up. So we got in touch and he was like constantly like, Hey, let's start a band. Let's start a band. I was like, man, I don't want to start a band. I'm really not trying to do that right now. And, um, you know, after months and months and months, I was like, all right, cool. Like, maybe we'll do it. Like, let's, let's, let's do it. So I went and I met him out at a bar one night and I was like, all right, so what are we going to do? He's like, oh, my girlfriend's pregnant. I'm moving to California. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> and I remember being so bummed because we had, you know, played, you know, in, in each other's apartments, writing songs. And, you know, I had actually even played on one of the, songs that was supposed to be on the Joshua Pfeiffer battle discography because it was like, all right, here's all our songs and this other song that we did on the side. And they never made it on the record because everyone was like, yo, Sal isn't playing this band. Like, what the fuck is this song? <laughs> and <laughs> which rightfully so. So, um, uh, yeah, so I didn't play in a band for a while. Uh, um, I played in a band maybe a year or two later with uh, the dude from that band Cable Car Theory from Staten Island. And uh, I was, you know, going back and forth between Manhattan and Staten Island to play in this band. And that was just, 
it was it was really fun to play with those guys. I played guitar in that band, but it was just such a miserable like. You know, I remember getting out of work, I had my guitar, and I'd take the subway down to the Staten Island ferry, and I'd, you know, get to Staten Island, and I'd be sitting there at the ferry terminal waiting for one of these dudes to pick me up, and I'd be there for, you know, half hour to an hour, and then after a while, like, there was a few times I had to ride the bus from the, the ferry terminal to the practice beach, which was in some random, like, industrial area of Staten Island. And, you know, when they would drop me off at the end of the night, if I missed the ferry, another one wouldn't come for an hour. So I'd fall asleep in the fucking ferry terminal. And we did this for months and months and months. And it was just, it was so much different than being in a band in New Jersey where I was able to just load all my equipment in my car and just, you know, drive up to Sean and Matt's house or drive up to New Brunswick, which is where we practiced the majority of the time. We had like a rental space. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's Staten Island band. It was called uh, Den of Thieves. And I love those dudes. But that was definitely like that was <laughs> that yeah. was a tough. Yeah, back that and sounds forth. that sounds very taxing. Just to like <laughs> waiting and pick get get picked up and wait and wait and then like yeah, I I I feel like I don't know if I could do that honestly for for I mean as long as you did. I mean, yeah. uh, there's a lot of people that do that that like will play in bands in other states and they'll like travel back and forth. Like I think when Josh was playing in. Neil Perry and Joshua Fit for Battle, he'd drive back and forth between Jersey and Delaware and Philly or I know there's like it's not like, you know, a lot of people have done that, but it's definitely like that was taxing for me for <laughs> yeah. sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so yeah, after that, you know, after that, uh Lagretia, I remember in two thousand eight, uh Jay, who used to play in the assistant, also played in this band called Bound with uh jason and dana and uh jay had moved to richmond and he was up in brooklyn visiting and he had called me up he's like hey you should come out to this bar or whatever and uh i met up with jay and jason and dana were there and uh we had hung out all night we had a really good time and they were like hey we're starting a band like you know would you want to play and i was like no nah, i don't think i'm really trying to do that right now and they're like oh you should really you know we're really gonna like I don't know, we have all these songs written and, you know, I was like, nah, I don't know, I'll think about it. And I think, you know, at that time, I had been married uh, three years and, you know, we were living in Brooklyn for a while and, you know, a lot of our friends were like couple friends and we would all do like couple things. And it was, you know, you've seen Talladega Nights where like, you know, Ricky Bobby's dad is like, in the Applebee's and he's like, yeah. I think I want to get thrown out of this Applebee's. <laughs> like there was definitely something in my mind. I was like, damn, this is fucking, this is, I'm bored. I'm fucking bored. So, you know, I called Dana a few days later and we like met up and got pizza and I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's, you know, let's see, you know, what this is all about. And I had no idea there was already like a band in motion because I was definitely like, you know, not familiar with certain punk message boards and shit like that. Yeah. So when I told a friend of mine, I was like, hey, I'm like joining I'm this band with Jason and Dan. And they were like, oh, it's like Lagretia. And you guys have like songs already. And I'm like, and I was like, how do you know that? They're like, it's all over the internet. And I had no idea. Because I remember when I showed up to the first practice and it went well. And I was like, hey, we should name the band this. And it was just some silly name or whatever. And they were like, no, we have a, like a name already. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And they were like, yeah, and we're like doing this record and we're going to put it out. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And we have all the songs written already. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so it got like less like all right but i was also just like equally as excited to have like you know new friends and people to jam with instead of just like hanging out at bars and just getting wasted and not playing music so um but the thing with that was you know we played a bunch of times we booked our first show which was like the showcase out in denver colorado and then you know i i'd mentioned like hey i want to join this band because like all my friends a couple friends and you know i was getting a little bored and then they told me that they were dating and i was like oh. <laughs> damn it and i was like really and they were like yeah like would you still want to be in the band and i was like yeah i guess <laughs> after we'd already done all this stuff and i remember like telling jason like you know months down the line because someone was like yo if you knew they were dating would you join the band and i was like fuck no and he got really upset he was like really you wouldn't have joined the band if you knew we were dating i'm like man who would who would yeah, want to yeah. do that <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> but yeah that was that so in, in um 
so was it just on parallels was like the only thing that like came out for for that band or yeah that was that was it i mean we you know i think when i had joined the band they had like three songs down but jason had you know a whole cache of songs yeah or, or written and you know it was it was tricky because i didn't realize what that was you know like we went into it like all right we're gonna be this band but I think Jason was like more of almost like a solo act who was like, all right, I wrote these songs and, you know, these are my songs. And every time I tried to be like, all right, well, what if we change this or do this? He would like kind of get a little upset about it. Like, whatever, I wrote the songs this way. These are the songs. And I was, I was like, man, this is not like any band I've ever been in, in the yeah. sense that like, you know, one dude's calling all the shots. So that was kind of like, a, you know, uh, a little bit of a bummer with that. I mean, I really enjoyed playing in that band and, you know, Jason and Dana were both, I mean, Dana's like one of my best friends to this day. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, it was, it was a definitely a weird band. <laughs> it didn't last very long. And then, and then versus narrow was after that or, or was there something in between those, those two bands? <laughs> well, it's funny because when uh, Lagrisha broke up, me and Dana were writing music together. And um, Mike, who is now her husband, uh, was uh, in bands. And he had moved up to Brooklyn from Richmond, Virginia. He was like one of those dudes. I think he played in, in Pink Razors. Mm. And so me, Mike, and Dana started playing together. And we were like going to do a band. And I think we made it like two practices and <laughs> I remember Dana coming to the apartment and, uh, you know, she was like really upset about it. She was like, I have something to tell you, like me and Mike are dating now. And I was like, no, <laughs> I was like, you can't make this shit up. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that was the in between Lagrisha versus Narrow and, um, yeah, uh, and then when Versus Narrow happened, you know, Brian Louie had been had moved back from L.A. and he was in New York for a few years. And I forget what it was. Oh, you know what it was? Aaron, who played with uh, Sean in Takaru and Burial Year, moved out to Brooklyn from California. And he moved, like, just a few blocks away from me. And he kept asking to, like, start a band. And I was like, no, I don't want to do it. No, I don't want to do it. Cause he had, you know, come out from California to, to uh, open up a coffee shop. Mm. And I was like, yeah, man, you're like working full time trying to do this business. And, you know, I don't really have any time or energy to do a band. And he just kind of like kept asking and kept asking. So what that was, was me, Aaron, and then it was Brian from Penfold had started a band together. So we were like, had a practice space. We were jamming a bunch. But Brian from Penfold, like, had a full-time job, and he could only practice, like, sometimes. But we wanted something that could we could play a little bit more regularly. And I was like, I know this other dude, Brian, but I'm going to warn you, Aaron, like, if I ask him to play with us, it's going to be a little bit more serious than, you know, we want it to be. Not like we're serious, we're going to tour all the time, but just, like, on, like, a, you know, musicianship standpoint, like, you know, we like to play things a certain way, and... You know, he's like a little bit more of like a serious musician. And uh, that's how that started. So it was me, Brian and Aaron. And that's when, you know, Versus Narrow got going. And we were, we started out just trying to be like a shellac ripoff band. But then from that, it started getting a little bit more like Jesus Lizardy, which is what I was obsessed with at the time. Because, you know, uh, when I saw Jesus Lizard for the first time, and I think it was 2007 or 80, just like, blew my fucking mind open like i couldn't i that was like one of those few instances like where you see a band and your jaw hits the floor and you're just like what the fuck yeah. like you know Definitely. you know when that happens it's like such a beautiful feeling and like i'd always liked that band maybe i'd heard a few songs but i never really understood what it was i would say that about the same time like you know the first time i saw quicksand like i liked it but i didn't really get it until i was like a little bit older so Am I talking too much? I don't know. No, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I prefer it. You know what I mean? Because uh, like I said, I, I want to hear your stories and, 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 you know, your time with the bands that you were in and, and also uh, like uh, speak really quickly about your artwork because like I, I 
looked at your artwork and I think it's phenomenal. Like, how did you get into that? I know you started making covers and stuff like that, but how did that kind of, you know, come to fruition? What, what you're doing nowadays? Um, I think, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, the artwork thing, uh, when I was doing like flyers and shirts and shit for bands, like in the nineties, I would do it all like on a photocopy machine or I would just like draw it out. And I remember a buddy of mine I went to high school with, uh, Greg, he was going to uh, SVA and he came home and I would show him a bunch of the flyers I was doing. And he was like, yo, you should do this with Photoshop. And I was like, man, I don't know what that is. And he was like, yo, I got uh, like a pirated copy from SVA. So he let me have it. And, um, you know, I put it, my parents, I think, finally got a computer in like 99. So I was like already out of high school. So I had a computer to actually work on. And, um, you know, I started doing, you know, building a portfolio like that. But I was always, you know, you know, growing up like, uh, like a anxious kid that drew a bunch. So it was always like, all right, well, what outlet are you going to like, push this nervous energy through whether it's music, whether it's drawing or, you know, whatever. But I think, you know, all these years later in working in graphic design and I just wanted something that was a little bit more organic or something that's, I guess it's pretty much escapism, right? You just want something you're working on and then like, you know, you just kind of disappear for a few hours. And that's kind of where that came from. And I was lucky enough in my career that I was able to freelance for um, so many years and I was able to uh, take extensive amounts of time off work. So, you know, in 2007, I want to say I started my own uh, company, like my own LLC, where I was, you know, doing design for companies. But there was like, it was few and far between as, as far as projects go. So there would be a lot of downtime. And in that downtime, I was just trying to build up pieces of work that I could show to other clients and be like, Hey, I did this, like, check this out. Like, would you want me to do this for your company or your fucking t-shirt brand or whatever? And then it just kind of manifested itself into this weird, um, building these weird environments out. And I, I kind of saw it coming to life, like maybe as, as early as back in like 2012. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was lucky enough to be able to rent all of these spaces. I want to say every borough I lived in, I had like an art space where I was like renting it out and I could go there and like paint and draw or whatever. So um, now we've moved out to the suburbs and I have this like garage that I've converted into like this makeshift studio. And uh, I'll just kind of hold this up a little bit and hopefully I won't drop everything. But yeah, I got, uh, you know, some mic stands and stuff around, but uh this is my uh, oasis to, uh, you know, make drawings and stuff. And uh, it's something that, um, you know, something I did just as uh, whenever I had time. Now it's something I like have to do or I'll lose my goddamn mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love drawing too as well. I wish I had kept up with it. I, I did a lot of flyers as well back in the day, uh, I, but I never kind of stuck with it. Um, I can still like, my my problem was I can't really think of something on my own. I'm I'm more of a, you give me a picture I can copy it. Like a reference, good. yeah. But like thinking up stuff on my own, I'm just I'm just not that very. Uh, I'm just not good at it. So uh, I wish I I still you know here and there I'll draw with my daughters and they're like wow daddy you're you're really good at drawing and uh, so I kind of wish I could get back to doing that and uh, I think it's awesome that that what you're doing now and, and still you know, making amazing, like, especially like your pencil and uh, your black and white stuff that you do is, is like really, really good. Um, you know, so uh, hats Thanks, off man. You that stuff. I, I love, I love like <laughs> looking through it because I'm a huge art guy too. And I love, I love drawing and I love, you know, um, graphic design and stuff like that. So uh, uh, like I said, hats off to you. Uh, um, um, it's awesome to see you doing stuff like that too, as well. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Now, uh, do you do you uh, have the fever uh, now of like being in a heavy band at all? Um, because I'm gonna say re real quick that like your screaming is 
like <laughs> like i said live and on on cd is like amazing you know what i mean i love heavy music i love i love alternative music and hip-hop and all different kinds of music too but but um you know days refrain the dual vocals and also like the singing um I'm not huge into singing with with heavy music, but like some bands can just pull it off. Like like I Robot can pull it off, and, and like Early Grace and like Early Cave In, and like you guys had that niche where like it was just so perfect with like the singing and then the dual screaming. Um, do you ever feel like that that fever inside you to go back and do some screaming uh, nowadays? For sure, man. I love heavy music. I mean. The one thing I don't miss is is lugging around uh, all the equipment. But <laughs> damn, going back to the iRobot thing, man, that scream was probably the most intense I've ever heard. That was just like a force to be reckoned with, man. That dude's like the power that came, the, whatever that came out of that dude's mouth, I was like, God damn, like that was. Yeah, that, that uh, et cetera, et cetera uh, CD is so crazy to me. And it, like I said, it kind of reminds me of like the singing that like, you guys don't sound the same, but I'm saying like that singing worked for that band in between the, the chaotic screaming and same thing with you guys. Like you guys would go so heavy and then, you know, Sean would, would, uh, you know, belt out like some real heartfelt singing and it, it just went so good together. And, and like I said, early cave in would kind of hit me like that. Not when they kind of got, you know, Jupiter and stuff like that, but that first beyond hypothermia album and, and, um, also with Early Grace down in Florida, the Straight Edge Band, they kind of did a little bit of the singing too and was like really, really heavy. Uh, it just, there's not a lot of bands that can pull that off. And uh, like I said, I, I, I it just, I, I that's why you guys always gripped me so like heavy back in the day. And, and uh, uh, Thanks, man. <laughs> no, I just, and, and like I said, holding on to silence. I haven't heard that album in so long because I had, I had the CD and then I lost it. And that's why like I searched everywhere for it. It was like one of those hidden treasures that, <laughs> that you can't find on the internet. Like, Dude, I will, I will send you the MP3s. Them. I'm pretty certain I have those somewhere and I will, I will absolutely send those to you. Cause I don't think I've heard them in such a, a, a long time, but yeah, Sean, like, cause I think Sean was, that was all his vocals on, on that one. And he just crushed it, man. Sean's, Man, he was like, me and Sean, man, the way we used to write together and, you know, like I remember I would come straight from work and he was, I think he was working at a bookstore at the time and we would, you know, meet up at nights and just write music together. And it was definitely like some of the best times. Like we would just, you know, mesh together so well. And I miss that dude. I miss him so much. You know, he's, you know, we don't talk as, I mean, I guess you could say that for anyone, you know, um, you know, at this age you know we don't really you know have we don't i don't know we just i mean we have all this accessibility to st keep in touch but like not many of us are good at it myself being the culprit is being terrible at keeping in touch with people but yeah yeah, yeah. I, I mean i'm the same way it, it's uh it's it's weird when you get older it's and especially when you it's no excuse that like we have families and stuff like that but it's just uh i'm i'm kind of the same way i'm horrible at getting in touch with people uh you know i try to get in touch with somebody if they get in touch with me but i don't reach out necessarily um the, the only time i've really been reaching out is is like to do these discussions with you know musicians and artists that i admire and it's kind of taken me out of the the box because like I wasn't like when I went to shows and when I was in bands, I wasn't really the guy that came up and was just like, Hey, Hey man, like, uh, blah, blah, blah. Like I would just be like, Oh, six set. Like, and that was it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so my comfort zone doing these talks were very like, I was nervous <laughs> as fuck when I first started because like, you know, the first couple of ones I was talking to my friends that were in bands that I'd known for years and stuff like that. But when I'm talking to people that I never talked to really face to face, it's kind of, you know, the anxiety would hit and, and stuff. And, and I feel like it's almost to take me in a positive route to like kind of overcome anxiety and just like COVID and stuff like that. And kind yeah. of, you know, it's given me kind of like a, I don't know, like a, I don't know. It's hard to say just, just focused, I guess, on, on positive stuff and, and, taking me outside of the box and I, and I've enjoyed it, uh, you know, thoroughly doing these things. And I'm going to try to do at least like, I don't know, maybe this is my 31st uh, discussion on oh, wow. Instagram. So uh, I'm going to try to do a hundred and then, you know, <laughs> Oh man, that's fucking awesome. 
Yeah, it's hard. I mean, Matt was just texting with me yesterday. I don't think we've spoken in a long time. And he was, you know, sending me pictures and stuff from years and years ago. And I don't know if he was just, you know, had found like an old, like a a drawer full of all this old stuff and started sending it to me or, or whatever. But I miss that dude a whole lot too, man. And we don't live that far apart. So I don't know. There's like no reason for us not be, to be able to, you know, get together and such. But, uh, but yeah, it was, you know what was, I mean, if you need to cut this off, let me know. I don't want to get into another story. No, no, anymore, no, but, yeah, no. I, but I remember like being, you know, a younger kid and like doing shows, whether it would be in a basement or renting out a VFW and like doing shows with people in bands that were much older than me. And I felt like such a little kid. And, um, you know, those definitely, you know, being like an anxious, like more reserved kid. I remember this one show I had done at the Eminem Hall, and I think it was uh, that band Drowning Man. I got them to come down to Jersey for a show, and I think I just bugged Simon enough that they came down. And uh, there was this other band that was supposed to play. There was some band from Boston. It was like more of like a youth crew band. If you told me the name of it, I would remember. But they were supposed to play that day in New Jersey, and their show got canceled and uh at the melody bar so i was like yeah come on you guys can play my show and it was just ended up being a long show that was even longer and fuck what the hell was the name of this band i think dana actually even played drums for them for a while too Uh, i don't know anyway the singer like totally like i'm like this young kid and he's like in my face yelling at me like so angry like you said we could play this show and like you know I don't like, why are we playing so late? We got to drive all the way back to Boston. And he like, he was very upset with me. And I was like, yo man, you guys, your show got canceled. Like, you know, I'm just doing you guys a favor by letting you guys play. And I I just couldn't understand why this like dude who seemed like a grown ass man was like yelling at me. And um, I remember, uh, you know, a bunch of dudes who were at the show. Cause I think it was a pretty well attended show, but there was like a bunch of, Jersey dudes behind me, they were like, yo, you saw that guy yelling in your face. Do you want us to take care of him? And I was just like, what do you mean? They're like, they can't come down here and do that shit. Like, that shit does not fly. And I remember being like, oh, wow. Like, all these dudes, like, you know, not that I was going to abdicate for anything violent or whatever. But then I remember uh, Chris Wass, who played in Nora and also had done a bunch of shows at that time, came up to me and he was like, yo, man, there's this dude who writes for the zine. And if you don't let this band play, he's going to write something really bad about our scene in New Jersey. And we just can't let that happen. And I just remember being like, man, this dude is like the only, I don't know where I was going with, with just like telling the story, but I remember this dude being like caring more about like this, the, the state of the scene than like, you know, this dude who is this grown ass man. What the fuck was the name of this band? It's going to kill me. Tom, 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 Tom says, Reach the sky. That was it. It was reach the sky. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> that was it. Um, but yeah, I remember like I'd always deal with all of these bands that you know had all in my mind they were like grown ups, and I was just like this little kid. So that was like always this weird standoffish thing you had when booking shows, especially like when you were like, "Hey, can you come out and play?" and then like. You know, they'd show up and I'd be like this 15 year old kid, like, hey, can you guys play for 50 bucks? And they just drove all this way and, you know, <laughs> yeah. just being like worried, like, are they going to be mad at me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that's funny. It's reached the sky. I just like, um, <laughs> I just like uh, put a eight millimeter tape to a DVD of the like recordings that I did. And <laughs> it was like a reach no, the sky sure. Bane, Bane show at UNH, which is weird that it was <laughs> reach the sky. I wasn't huge on reach the sky. It was a uh, much more into Bane than I was Reach the Sky. Uh, so, like, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it makes sense, you know what I mean? I remember telling Brian McTurn in that story because we were recording with him at the time, and he got so angry. He was like, what? He was like, I had that guy in here, like, two weeks ago, and he was crying because he couldn't hit the vocals right. So, like, you tell him. And I was like, man, I'm not trying to tell anybody anything. I'm just telling you the story. <laughs> <laughs> uh it's uh like i love these stories though so um like i said i it's i i love when i talk to people and and they tell stories like this because like i said the the a lot of people don't hear these stories and and um i feel like a lot of people are are trying to 
hear about these stories and see old old videos of of bands and stuff like that. Uh, Pete from Sinaloa had started a tin can full of dreams um, IG, where he's putting all the all the old pictures up and maybe some videos of that. Um, you know, 400 years and like Pieball when they were really oh, that's awesome and stuff like that. So I feel like nowadays everybody's really like into like um, the nostalgia of back then. You know what I mean? And that's why I try to put out as many videos as I can on my Instagram and, and um, I try to put on like stuff on YouTube too, just because I feel like people are like really, you know, miss that stuff. And I feel this hidden tapes that people have that aren't putting, you know, they're not getting it converted and they're just lost tapes. You know, I'm sure there's like a bunch of days refrain shows that just haven't hit the internet. You know what I mean? So. Well, um, even like in this time now, like with, you know, no one can really go to shows right now. So I find myself falling down like, you know, YouTube wormholes and stuff like that. And thank God that stuff is there because yeah, I miss seeing music so much. Yeah, I do. I do too. Um, I don't want to keep you too long. I know you, I know you have, have uh, people over at your house and, and like <laughs> I said, su Sunday's usually family time for a lot of people. So uh, usually I throw these rapid fire questions at people at the end. Um, so I'll just start doing that right now. Wait a minute. Favorite New England hardcore uh, or punk band from New England? Like, you know, Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut. Um, oh, shit. Rhode, Rhode Island. Man, I fucking loved Caven. And, yeah, Caven. Uh, my second one is, what was the first punk hardcore show you attended? Uh... I want to say there was a uh, show done at a fire hall in my hometown and uh, my buddy Jay's band played and it was their pop punk band called the youth ahead. And I remember going and being like, Whoa, you could just do this. Like, and I think his dad like ran, uh, he was a fireman and he like, you know, rented the fire hall out. So uh, I think that might've been like one of the first times I saw like a, a band play in a, you know, a hall or something like that. So I guess that was like my first, show i think i had to have my mom drive me there because i couldn't drive so yeah i think that was it <laughs> <laughs> uh, my next one all-time favorite punk hardcore show you played um oh, i mean man. it could be it could be a couple because everybody has like a few shows that just really stood out to them um, um there was definitely i think a show we had played in california uh maybe southern california where you know where we played and I remember just feeling like, Oh, I'm so far from home. And it seems like a few of these people may know the words to these songs. And it's like one of those things where, uh, I don't know, you just kind of look out and it's, uh, I don't know. It's something that, uh, just kind of, I don't know. It's, it's so corny to say, cause I remember like watching that jawbreaker documentary and he was like, yeah, I remember we played this one song and I just like, watched it float over the crowd. Like it was no longer ours. Like it was just out there. And he's like, I'll fucking say it. It was emo as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so not that it was like, you know, I, I just remember, I, I remember laughing at that, but I just remember like looking out and seeing a lot of other people singing along. And I just remember being really like, damn, that's fucking awesome. Um, my next question, all time favorite punk hardcore show you attended. Uh, probably the last lifetime show um i'm a huge movie guy so i always ask this to everybody out what was the last movie you watched damn uh me and my wife have been watching the whole fast and furious franchise because we had never seen one of those movies <laughs> and we're like yo let's just watch all of them so we've been slowly like chipping away at it and they're pretty fucking amazing. <laughs> They're so ridiculous. I love it. Uh, so, yeah, I want to say probably one of those was the last one I saw. Which is funny because I think you're the first person that uh, that I've heard that said those are amazing. So <laughs> <laughs> They're so ridiculous. You got to, I mean, <laughs> I definitely wake up some mornings. I'm like, man, maybe I could be Vin Diesel. Like, I have a similar name. I mean, not Diesel, but, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah i i uh I, my last movie i watched um nomadland uh with um oh it's francis mcdormand yeah right? that was the last movie i watched which was really really good like really good um i know it's i, I think they were talking about uh it going up for an oscar too um but i've only seen maybe i've seen uh 
oh, what was that movie? Um, it was about a girl that was kind of trying to get revenge for her girlfriend. Um, oh, uh, Promising Young Woman? Yeah, prom those yeah are we watched that. Those are the only two movies that I've seen uh, like that are getting put um, forth for Oscar. I haven't seen the other ones yet. Yeah, that was that one was okay. I mean, yeah, do we like that one? Yeah, I think we like that one. Carrie Mulligan. I think that was pretty. I think that was pretty good too. I I I, I enjoyed that movie too. It didn't have I the ending. Did. I definitely I would expect. Not. Oh, go ahead. Oh, it wouldn't have the ending. I would have expected, but yeah, that was that was pretty good. I mean. There was no like drifting of cars, but it was <laughs> it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. The ending caught me. I was like, whoa! Like I, I'm I'm not trying to give anybody any spoilers, but like the ending caught caught me where I was like, whoa! I didn't expect that, but uh, it yeah. was it was a decent movie. Um, my next question: uh, favorite all time horror movie for you? Ooh, that's a good question. As I am a fan of the genre, um, for me, the big one. And to this day, it was probably Halloween 4. Uh, and Halloween, yeah, that scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. So for a nostalgia factor and just all around, even now seeing all the movies within that franchise, I'd still go back to Halloween 4. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, uh, I've heard good things about the new one that's going to come out. I, I think, is it... Is it uh, was it, is it Halloween Kills? Is that what Halloween it's Kills, yeah. That's going to yeah. come out this... And it's going to be another one with Jamie Lee Curtis. And uh, I like the one they made last year. That was good. The, yeah. I yeah mean, was... It's weird because it was like one of those things where they just kind of like disregarded all the sequels and everything. But I didn't care. It was just a good almost, solid they, flick, they right? Almost, yeah. They kind of almost did like, what was it after part two, right? That's like years and years later, right? Yeah. Yeah. Years later. Yeah. Um, I, I always say um, I'm a big fan of uh, Possessor. Have you seen that movie? No, I have not. That is uh, David Cronenberg's son, Brandon Cronenberg, uh, directed a movie called Possessor that came out in 2020. Um, it's really, really, it's like, it has a, like a little sci-fi flair to it, but it, it's more of like a, a person that this company like can go under and do assass, assass, uh, assassin missions uh, through brain control. So they like abduct somebody, put them under, put this thing in their brain and then somebody goes under a machine and then they control their their brain so they basically take over their mind and they go out and and assassinate people and then they kill themselves and then she goes back into like she awakes in the machine as you know what i mean Damn, it's very, that sounds yeah, intense. yeah it's it's really good if you get a chance i don't know if you have hulu but uh they just put it on hulu um, oh cool i do have you seen mandy i have like the only person who has not seen mandy I have seen Mandy. I <laughs> as, as weird as weird as that movie is, I uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was. Uh, I mean, I'm not a huge huge Nicolas Cage fan now. I was back in the day, you know, Wild at Heart and and um, you know he's done some good movies, but uh, you know further on in his career, he's kind of done some cheesy movies. But, <laughs> uh, like honestly, I really enjoyed that movie. Um, you should definitely check it out. It's it's well worth the watch. Definitely. It's been on my list, man. I got to get to that one. Yeah. <laughs> but but the thing with Mandy is it's not on I don't think it's on anything streaming except maybe Shudder. I don't have Shudder, but Yeah, I, me neither. It's not on Prime. Yeah. Hmm. So you can't I, you can't find it on any of the um it's not on Netflix, it's not on Amazon Prime, it's not on Hulu. So I'm just like watch it again once it, it gets put on something like that, but um um I only got two more questions. Uh, I, I, I was a DC uh comic guy uh so i always ask dc or marvel for you enough if i'm damn i would say probably marvel but as i was like growing up buying comics image had just started and i remember me and my friend mark were just like buying up all those early image titles i remember and i'm sorry this is you asked me dc or marvel but <laughs> for some for whatever reason i yeah because i remember like i bought um at the time, I was, like, actively really buying comics. I remember, like, the first few Morbius uh, comics came out, and me and my buddy were really into those. So I would say Marvel as compared to DC, but definitely we were just so excited about all the image stuff at that time. And I remember uh, me and my friend Mark would just go to the comic store every week and just try and get as many comics as possible. Yeah, Im Image has been doing some really, really great, like, stories uh, in the past, like, 
I'd say the past 15 years, they've done a lot of original like stories that aren't, you know, not superheroish, more kind of, you know, uh, you know, drama with, yeah. with, you know, a flair of violence and stuff like that. Um, but they've really put out some real original content for Image in the past 15 years. And I try to pick up like a graphic novel here and there because they just keep spitting out like, you know, awesome, interesting things. And, and I see sometimes that, you know, Netflix will pick up, um, you know, the title, but I haven't seen anything really come uh, about it yet. But uh, like, I love Image too. I like Image now than, you know, I was a huge DC guy, uh, because just, just, I love Marvel too. But DC was just like more street level, like, you know, just like, it wasn't gotcha. so much outer, outer space um, heroes and stuff like that. So that's why I was kind of drawn to DC a little bit more. But um, like I said, I, I love Image and, and they, they've done some great stuff. Yeah. My grandfather, when I was growing up, he worked at a printing press up in the Bronx and they were printing all of those early Marvel titles. So he'd bring home like stacks of Marvel comics in the eighties. And I remember like looking at them, like just, like looking at my mom, like, yo, it's okay. I look at these, right? Like, so I remember like, you know, thinking they were like, not okay for me to look at, but I remember just being like totally in awe of all that stuff. Oh, that would have been me. That would have been amazing. <laughs> oh, God. Um, all right. My last question. What, what hip hop, uh, if you've been listening to any hip hop, have you been listening to lately? Um, I like all of that stuff, uh, like under the Griselda label that's been mm -hmm. coming out of like upstate New York, like Conway the Machine, Benny the Butcher, those dudes like Derringer, the DJ guy. Um, all that stuff is great. I love that Freddie Gibbs record that came out this year. I think that's up for like uh, a Grammy, like Freddie Gibbs and Alchemist. Um, yeah, Alfredo. Uh, Dave East. Dave East, uh, that record, not the last one he did, but the one before that, it was like Dave East and Styles P. That was like straight up like gritty New York style hip hop that I had not heard in, in such a long time. So, yeah, those are, uh, you know, my favorites at the moment. And, you know, there's probably a bunch of stuff that I'm missing out that came out this year. But, yeah, those are oh, uh, J.I.D. and uh, stuff that's come out on them. Um, uh, fucking um what the fuck what's his oh name? like the the spillage village guys like the the earth gang and J. the dude's down in carolinas what is it the dude who comes out on um, um man i really can't think of any fucking names today um yeah i, I don't know <laughs> it's, a, it's not it's not earth gang right i don't think it's earth gang no it's like uh who's the dude the dude who does uh dreamland the um yeah, is, is, is that, it same guy? But, but whose is it, label is it? Uh, that's like Spillage Village, isn't it? Isn't that what they're called? That that gang with JID and all those guys down there. Is it? Because uh, I know it's under like the umbrella of a bigger label, and I can't think of the name of uh, the dude who's like the the head of it all. Dreamville is it Dreamville? Like he oh, put out that. Yes, yes, yes. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, but I can't. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I I love the, the genre. <laughs> Yeah. Um, do you do you still listen to like 90s hip hop? Because I'm huge on 90s hip hop as well as like uh, the stuff you just mentioned. Yeah, I love like, you know, Pete Rock, CL Smooth, uh, uh, me and my buddy last year in the summer. I guess it wasn't last year because we've been going through this fucking virus thing, but we got to see De La Soul. Um, oh. It was you know, it was amazing. It was such an amazing show. My buddy uh, Mark hit me up and he's like, yo, do you want to go see De La Soul? And I was like, yeah, I do. And it's, they, they got on the mic and they were like, you know, all right, I want to see where everyone's at. Thinking they were going to be like, yo, who here's from Brooklyn? Who here's from the, but they were like, all right, who here is 40 and older? And everyone was like, <laughs> yeah. And he was just like, look at every, look at all you guys out there with your bad knees and your, <laughs> but yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, I do. I'd still love 90s hip hop. Um, it, it, like De La Soul, I heard a while ago, they said that, um, Pete Rock and DJ Premier were going to do, um, they were going to produce the beats for a whole new De La Soul album. I, I, they, they announced it and then I haven't heard anything. It's been maybe 10 months since I've heard anything about it. So uh, I was super excited about that because uh, DJ Premier and Pete Rock are like uh, some of my favorite producers of all time. And, and when, you know, De La Soul's on, on those guys beats, like, uh, like, I can't, you know, it's got to be amazing. So, uh, Dude, that's, but I, but I Tommy Boy it. did them so dirty, man. 
oh my god it's ridiculous i mean yeah. you can't, the the thing with like they won't let any of those classic albums stream is like ridiculous you know what i mean yeah. every uh, time we think the catalog is going to be released there's just something else that happens and there's a different reason why they can't release it and i thought they settled all the lawsuits but they still just it's yeah it, it sucks it's it's funny too that we're talking about de la soul because i had just seen that they uh they did an episode of Teen Titans Go where they do the voices and they show up uh, <laughs> on a Teen Titans Go episode that just premiered, I think, like yesterday. No uh, shit. Yeah. So my, my, my littlest daughter uh, loves Teen Titans Go. So uh, I'm going to try to catch that as, as soon as I can. But uh, I... <laughs> That's awesome. One of, them, uh, uh, one of the women that works for me on my team, she, her sister draws uh, – storyboards and character development for teen titans go and they she worked her into one of the episodes oh really? as no like kidding. an irs auditor or whatever she sent me the <laughs> screenshot she was like look my sister put me in the episode i was like oh that's so fucking cool yeah i mean my daughter loves that and i like she's got me to sit down and watch it and I, like at first i was like oh i'm not gonna like this and then i <laughs> as, as crazy as it sounds i really enjoy, i really enjoy that cartoon so uh I'm kind of pumped that that you know De La Soul's on there, and uh, I'm I'm kind of excited to <laughs> I'm kind of excited wow. to see it. <laughs> all right, cool. But uh, all right, I'm gonna let you go because uh, I've held you way too long. It's almost been two hours. Oh, dude, uh, this was so fun, man. I'm like, uh, I mean, we've we've never met before, so this was just like you know we hit the ground running, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that, well, that's the awesome thing about it is like. I love this too, because it's face to face. It's not like a podcast where, you know, your voice is coming in and like, we, we actually like, it's more of an interaction, more, more personal. And, and uh, like I said, I like the organic flow of talking. I don't, you know, I have like a little set thing that I usually do, but like, I love the organic flow of like talking to somebody face to face, you know what I mean? And uh, uh, t tonight has been super fun for me. And uh, I want to thank you so much for taking time out, especially like taking time out. I know like we both have families and, and I kind of feel bad always taking people away from their families for a little while, but I feel it's important that people hear about a day's refrain and what you've been up to and your artwork and stuff like that. And um, like anybody that like wants to take a dive back in day's refrain, like please do because like it's one of my favorite bands of all time back then. And, and uh, like I said, I, I just want to thank you so much again. And um Anything you'd like to say before we? Uh, um, no, man. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, uh, I wish Sean and Matt were here with me to talk about it, and we would probably just be laughing over each other. Or, you know, uh, you know, I miss being in the same room with those dudes, and you know. Uh, but yeah, thank you for for having me on. Definitely, and and please, if you if you can uh, send me those MP3s because I'm dying to hear that stuff again. I'm I'm like super super dying. And uh, please let's stay in touch. Like I always, um, you know, love to stay in touch with people. Anything that I can do uh, for you, if you need anything up in New Hampshire or whatever, it, let's say if you get into another heavy band and, and COVID's done with, um, I still uh, are planning on setting up shows up here. So uh, anything I can do for you, I'll, I'll help you out. And um, I uh, hope thanks, stay, stay safe, man. And, and I hope, hope you have a good year and hope this COVID shit goes away. And, uh, you know, we could maybe you play a show up here and we could, you know, I've seen you face to face at shows, but not like this. So um, oh. hopefully someday we can just like shoot the shit someday. Yeah, man. I hope so. Well, thanks for having me, man. Take All care. right, man. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Take care. All right. Thanks. All right.